Hey guys, we're in chapter two still, and we're looking at some of the concepts that we're going to find in the Constitution. Uh, we're going to look at today at um, the Democratic Republic, at a separation of powers, checks and balances, some of those things that we've heard so many times before, but we're going to examine what do they mean and where are they found in the Constitution. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at today is democratic republic. A democratic republic means that the citizens are going to have um, kind of the final say, that they're going to have a voice in our national government. Now, uh, when we look at the Constitution, the original Constitution, the way it was written in the 1700s, what we're going to find is that there's only one office at the national level that the citizens directly elect, and that is the House of Representatives. And so the, the uh, representative republic, where the, the citizens are represented by someone in Washington, D.C., uh, they're going to directly elect only the representatives in the House of Representatives, and they're going to do so every two years. Now, the Senate is going to be elected by the state legislatures, who are normally elected by the citizens as well. So they are indirectly elected, okay? They are indirectly elected, and that's going to change in, in an amendment later on. We're going to talk about that when we get to the amendments in a couple minutes. Um, but for um, the House of Representatives, is the only place where we have a direct election. Okay, so the people are very close to the House of Representatives. And we're going to talk about why that is when we get to chapter 12 in uh, two, three weeks. Uh, but right now, we want to know that we have a democratic um, republic. The republic means that people are going to go and represent us, and they are going to vote on our behalf. Now, how they do so, that's a whole other story, and we're going to get to that as well when we get to chapter 12. But for now, a democratic republic is going to be uh, when we're going to go out and we're going to maybe select somebody to represent us. Okay, the next one that we want to look at is separation of powers. Separation of powers, uh, we remember we talked about Montesquieu, and he said that there's... Um, Power is too strong of a thing to give to just one person or to one group. And so the United States takes that idea from the Enlightenment thinkers and they spread the power out among three branches of government. So we have a judicial branch who's going to interpret the laws and they are going to be kind of the, the watch over um, in, in, in America. So this is going to be our court system and they're going to rule on what's legal and what's not legal. We have an executive branch, and they're the ones who are going to enforce the laws. After they're made, they're going to decide, here's, what, here's how they should be enforced. And then we have the um, legislative branch, and this is where the power is going to be to make the laws. So they're going to make the laws, and then we're going to look at um, the judicial system and the uh, executive br branch to go ahead and enforce and interpret those laws and what they mean and are they legal, are they not legal. And so we spread that power out. If we don't only have the Congress, like we did in the Articles of Confederation, they have a lot more power than, uh, than, than um, they maybe should have. And so they can make the laws. It does not matter if it's constitutional or not because there's nobody to check them to say, hey, um, this, is, this is not something that we are allowed to do. If they do it, then they are allowed to do it. And so by spreading that power out, um, the, the, nobody gets too powerful and we, we have um, a much more successful government. So be, it would go, going forward with separation of powers, we wind up in checks and balances. Now, they are not the same thing. Separation of powers and checks and balances are not the same thing, and people often mix these things up. And we want to make sure that we are not those people. We want to make sure that we know the difference between separation of powers, checks and balances. Separation of powers is the spreading out of that power, giving some power to the judicial system, some to the executive branch, some to the legislative branch. That's spreading the power out. We're separating the power, literally, just like the, the, the term says. Now, checks and balances are going to be the, the things that are going to stop the uh, branches from becoming more powerful than they're supposed to. So, for example, the um, legislative branch can make the laws. They have the opportunity to make laws. Now, the president has the veto power. He can stop them from making laws that he doesn't think is a good idea. And so he has a check on the legislative branch to balance out that power, checks and balances. The, the judicial branch also has a check on the legislative branch. They can rule that what, they, what the legislative branch has passed is unconstitutional. And so they can say that law that you passed, 
not legal under the Constitution, and therefore we have to take that step back and it checks the legislative branch. Though the legislative branch has checks as well, um, they can override what the president has said. Um, they can um, pass an amendment that maybe the states can, can also ratify, which then uh, supersedes what the Supreme Court has said. They also get to... Um, to the Senate will um, approve any nominations or disapprove nominations that the president has put forward for the Supreme Court or for his cabinet, etc. Uh, and so there are checks and balances for between each of the three branches to make sure that that balance of power stays where it's supposed to be and we don't have one group that gets way up here while the other group is way down here. The, the power stays spread out like it's supposed to. So separation of powers in checks and balances go together, but they're very different things. We wanna make sure that we keep them separate. Our next big concept is gonna be federalism. Now, federalism, you're not going to find really just laid out as a definition in the Constitution, but federalism we can find in the Constitution. So let's start with what federalism is. Federalism is a system of government, and it's a system of government in which the parts of the government have power and the central government have power and they share that power. And that's gonna be our important word here. They share the power. Okay. Now, I did not say that they share it equally because there is going to be kind of a tug, uh, a tug of war for that power, but they share the power. So, for example, every state in our government, the parts, those parts, every state has the ability to set their own speed limits. Okay. Um, so, for example, in Illinois, it's 70. If we go out to Utah, it's 80. Um, and so the, the, the different states have different laws because when it comes to uh, speed limits. Now, the central government, the, uh, the United States government, they have the ability to start an army, to raise an army. Um, and so that's going to be very separate powers. Okay. And so the, the state governments get some powers and the, the national government also gets some powers, okay? And so they're going to share that power. You get some of these powers, we get some of these powers. Now, the concept is much, much deeper than that, and we're gonna to get to it, because we're gonna to to have a whole chapter, our whole chapter three is based on just federalism and that idea. But for now, just know that it's a shared power. But where do we find that in the Constitution? That's what we're looking at today. We find it in, in, in um, the uh, Amendment 10 that says that if it's, the, we look at the Constitution, and if the power to do something is not given to the legislative branch, the executive branch, or the judicial branch, if it's not given to one of those three, and it's not forbidden by the Constitution, we don't find somewhere where you can't do this, then that power goes automatically to the states or to the local governments or to the people themselves. Okay? And so if we look, there's nothing in the Constitution that says uh, Illinois can set the speed limit at 70. There's nothing in there. Therefore, every single state gets to select their own speed limit. And so we think of things like uh, voting laws. We think of things like uh, education. We think of um, all these things. And so this is why the states are going to differ from state to state on their laws. And the federal government is going to have uh, other parts where they are going to specialize and have laws for the whole country. So this is federalism, shared power between the parts and the national government. So our next big thing is that the Constitution is, is a living document. It, it breathes. Um, it has the ability to change. It is a flexible document. Now, we see this in a few different places. We see this in um, Article 1, Section 8, where we talked a little bit in the last uh, video about um, the, the um, elastic clause, where it kind of breathes a little bit here, where we can kind of make some, some laws based on what is necessary and proper for Congress to um, carry out their, their duties. Um, and so we see a little bit of it there, uh, but the flexibility really comes in in Article 5 in the amendment process. We have the ability to change the Constitution. Now, I'm going to do a separate video later on the actual amendment process and how that goes through because it is important that we really dig into that and we know that. Um, there's, uh, I would not be surprised to see an FRQ on the amendment process. Um, and so we want to make sure that we know the amendment process and how it works. But for now, know that um, the amendment process is there so that we can change over time. 
okay? That we can decide, oh, maybe things have evolved a little bit in our, in our culture that we now have decided that what was good in 1787 is not good for us in 2019. And therefore, we can change through time. Now, the amendment process, remember, over the last 200 plus years, we have only amended the, the Constitution 27 times. Um, and 10 of those were all done at once in the Bill of Rights. So really only 17 times beyond that, okay? So that means it's going to be difficult to do, but we do have the flexibility to change the Constitution where necessary. Next big big uh, thing that we wanna look at is national supremacy. And this is Article 6, and we talked a little bit about that in the last video as well. Article 6 is gonna talk about national supremacy, and that is the supremacy clause that says that the Constitution is the law of the land that we have this pecking order as we go through, that if there's ever a dispute over who has the power, here's how it goes, okay? And here is basically what we wanna look at. The number one power in the land is the, the, the United States Constitution. Underneath that would be laws passed by Congress or executive orders passed by the President. Underneath that would be um, state constitutions, and then underneath that would be state um, laws or executive orders by governors, and then be, below that is going to be county, and then below that is going to be city, and then maybe your, your house, okay? But um, we're, we've got that pecking order of here is where, if there's a dispute between who, who gets the power to do something and who, who supersedes to who, it goes in this order. So therefore, if there is a law, a law that is passed by the United States Congress, and it is constitutional for them to pass that law, um, Maybe Oklahoma can't pass a law that contradicts that. Um, the, the United States Congress would supersede the uh, state legislature in Oklahoma. So that's the national supremacy, the supremacy clause. So we're sharing power, remember, we have a federalist system, but we also have that pecking order of if there's a, if there's a conflict, here is, here is the hierarchy. And the United States Constitution is on top of that because of Article Six, the supremacy clause. Okay, as we finish up, the last thing we want to look at is the Constitution shows us that the framers intended for us to have a limited government. Okay, first off, the lawmaking process is deliberate and very, very slow and filled with areas of gridlock and barricades. We wanted to make sure, the framers wanted to make sure that the um, Constitution had uh, roadblocks so that if, if we really want to pass a law, there are obstacles that you have to overcome in order to do so. So for example, the first thing that we look at is um, we have two houses of Congress. So it's not just one group of people that you have to convince is a good law. You have two groups of people, the House and the Senate. We also have the veto power of the president, that if the president doesn't like what the Congress has done, both houses, there's another step to it. There's also the, um, the ability of judicial review from, the, from the, the court system to override things. And so we've got this very long, drawn out, um, obstacle filled process for a bill to become a law. Okay, and that's, that's, that's intentional. It's not an accident that that happened. It is so that we don't just automatically infringe on, on, on people's lives, that there is this, this system set up that we have a limited government. Okay, the next thing is if we look at the Senate, the, Senate, the House of Representatives is elected every two years. All, all 435 members is, are re-elected every two years. But the Senate, only one third of the Senate is up for election at any one time, which means two thirds are there um, beyond, that, beyond that election. So if there is a big wave of people that believe this particular fad um, this year and want this law passed, well, you still have two thirds of the old group there that you can't just reelect all these new people and have a law overcome. So we have to still slow things down and the, the Senate is done intentionally to do that. So we have the House, we have the Senate, we have veto power, we have all these things. We are intentionally limiting the government so that they are not get, going too far into uh, what we need um, in our lives. We also have the Bill of Rights, which is there. We've got 10, Bill of, 10 amendments in the Bill of Rights. You can hear my puppy barking upstairs. Um, the Bill of Rights is there to protect us from the government. Um, and so we have all these different things to make sure that the government does not have too much 
power. Remember, they're coming off of that Revolutionary War where the king, they thought, had too much power. And so we have limited government. And that's a big thing that we want to make sure that we know very uh, a lot, several examples of. This would be a great topic for a free response question. And so we want to be able to pull from all kinds of different places just in case. We want to, we want to have that, um, that in our arsenal of, uh, of, of writing. And so, folks, um, it's an icy day out there today, uh, but I'm glad that I was able to get into the LPAP Gov Studios today and make a quick video for you guys to kind of help you along in Chapter 2. Uh, like I said, I'm still going to make another video on the amendment process, which is in Chapter 2, but outside of that, we are going to be ready for that quiz on Friday, not Thursday. So if you're watching this video, you've got to step up on everybody who's going to be coming to class tomorrow and finding out that that quiz is on Friday and not Thursday now. Um, and we're going to we're going to get everything set up and we're going to uh, make sure that you guys are ready for that test in May. Remember guys, it's us versus the test. Help each other out. Uh, let me help you guys. We are all in this together and we are going to pass that AP test. And I can't wait to see you guys tomorrow in class. Be safe. We'll see you then.